everyone. Welcome. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town, a legislative update as we love to do uh, with our state representative, Sean Garbley. Sean, good to see you. James, good to see you. I hope you're well and warm during this snowy day. Doing pretty well in my comfortable kitchen, I have to say. Um, I, I, I did, you know, I say it's good to see you. And I, I really mean that because we've been trying for a while. Uh, this, this, uh, update has been put off for, you know, a few weeks now since we uh, initially tried. And that mostly has to do with the kind of schedule you were keeping uh, right through uh, the holidays and into, uh, into the new year. So I'd like to ask, you know, first of all, uh, it's an update. So we want to get a sense of, you know, what has happened of significance as far as your concern and the state legislature is concerned. Um, in the last session um, that you'd really like to highlight. And then um, what, uh, and then we'll focus on, on the months to come, which I think people are also going to be very interested in. But if you don't mind, Sean, just take us back through 2020, which hardly anybody wants to do um, <laughs> in certain ways, but nonetheless, the accomplishments were there uh, in the state house. So tell us what you think. Well, James, it's a, it's a very important question and my apologies for not being able to do this interview um, sooner. It seemed that every time we had scheduled a interview, um, I got called either into session or at the moment uh, on in, during informal sessions, um, I'm running them uh, in the House of Representatives, which kind of adds to my duties, which I enjoy, um, but it, uh, it takes precedence. So thank how did, you. How did, uh, how did that come about, Sean? Excuse the interruption. Uh, so the speaker has asked me uh, for informal sessions, which are usually every Monday and Thursday to help run uh, the sessions, which is a, a great honor for me and a, a privilege. And um, I, wow, I've that's, that I've sounds like it. a real distinction. That's, that's I've, great. Well, I, I've enjoyed it very much and to be able to help try, you know, this is the early part of the session, but to try to help pieces of legislation flow through the process and get through and engrossed and acted and then later, you know, done in the other chamber the same way and laid upon the governor is a, is a great privilege and to be able to have a role of being able to advocate for those bills that's important as well but to so get back that, to i'm it, sorry sean i'm going to keep going yeah. on this for a second is that like a testament basically to your seniority at this point um in the state house is it a, a reflection of the the you know relationship you've had with the the now new speaker or what yeah. You know, it's tough to say, uh, you know, I don't have an answer for you on that. The speaker asked me to uh, help run session, informal sessions. And so I, it's a great privilege to have. Um, you know, I think he tends to, he wants to rotate the chairs more. Um, one, it's, it's important to know how to do it, um, to make sure that business of the people gets done. Um, you know, but but I've enjoyed it very much. I have a close working relationship with the clerk's office and the committee on third reading. And uh, it's uh, a role that uh, I've enjoyed. I don't know if it's a role I'll continue to have, but it's the role I've done for the past two or three weeks now. And, and, and I enjoy it very much. Great. And if it helps me have a stronger position to advocate for our mutual priorities and some of my legislation, all the better to, to have it. Um, but to go back um, to your original question about 2020, you know, all of us have been touched in some way, mostly negative, unfortunately, by the pandemic of 2020. Um, cert and we're not over, it, right? So, uh, but when the pandemic started last March, it really did impact the schedule of the legislature. We had to figure out how to do business remotely. And then we had to figure out what business needed to get done to address this pandemic and to help the people of the Commonwealth, small business owners and government agencies of the Commonwealth that needed to conduct business and get business done. So it was a difficult time. And there were several months where we really couldn't get things done because it was COVID, 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 as it should have been. Uh, but we still had a lot of priorities that we wanted uh, to get done. So as many of your viewers may know, and I know you know, James, most of the time session ends the second, you know, it's a two-year session. And most of the time session ends the last uh, day of July. Uh, July 31st is when we kind of cram everything in to try yeah. to dealing with conference committee reports and bills that are going between the House and the Senate. Um, 
and then we have uh, kind of a break where members get reelected, you know, the primary in September and the general election in November, and then we get started in um, January. That first week of January, we get sworn in. But this cycle, because of COVID, we adopted emergency rules. We extended the session um, into the end of December, right, until we get sworn in the new legislature. We didn't postpone an election. Members had to campaign for the primary and the general. As you know, we had a um, cantankerous general election federally um, that has recently ended. Um, and we continued to meet in session and just got sworn in literally the day after we passed a number of bills, we swore in a new class, which really has never happened before. And so some of the bills that really kept us busy or kept the conference committee busy, of course, we all have our own individual priorities. Um, but we also have the House's priorities or the Senate priorities that have to go back and forth if they get through conference committees. So one of those priorities was the police reform bill, mm -hmm. which I know we've talked about before, James. Uh, it was a long process. You know, we saw some of the atrocities that happened um, in Minnesota with George Floyd, and, and we knew um, that the laws have, had to change in Massachusetts to try to pass comprehensive police reform that was fair to all parties, but created some justice, increased training, and put some clear definitions and prohibitions on police conduct like chokeholds and different things like that. Also mandating the duty to intervene if a police officer is on duty, that they have a, a not just a moral obligation, but a legal obligation now under this law um, to to intervene. And also an important part of that bill was to set up a, a really state agency within um, the governor's department on training um, to develop a, a, a whole network of um, when a complaint is made, you know, there'd be an investigation done at the local level but that this agency would deal with those complaints about certifying and decertifying um, police officers, but also standardize the training that is done across the Commonwealth. And to me, that was just so very important because we have very good, we have very many good police officers, but it's really, really important to make sure that the training is good but to make sure that the training and the amount of hours of training are equitable and to make sure that people who uh, have been or will be victims of police misconduct, you know, have their say, right? Mm -hmm. Have their ability to say what happened. And I think that's fair, but also to make sure that the police officer has um, recourse, right? In collective bargaining, which he or she uh, still does. But to me, it was just so important on the prohibition of chokeholds, the banning of it, but also to make sure that there was a state agency in place to look at the certification and decertification of police officers. So to me, this legislation was very, very important. It wasn't always clear that we were going to be able to get this legislation passed. It took a lot of months of deliberation between the Senate and the House. Um, to be able to get something passed. And within that legislation too, are very important commissions. You know, many times people look at commissions and say, oh, they'll, they'll never do anything. But the truth is that commissions are only successful if the members of those commissions view it as critical work. Mm -hmm. And one of the commissions is to look at civil service law. And so that's really important. And also to look at systemic racism. You know, we know systemic racism, racism is pervasive in policing, but we also know it's pervasive in education, it's pervasive in higher education, it's pervasive in town government and state government. Um, we know that it is pervasive everywhere. It's not just targeting one specific group of society. Um, but obviously the power differential is very different in this case. So there is a, there is a, a, 
um, a commission on to study and look at systemic racism across policing, but across our society as well, which I'm particularly proud of and believe that I'm really hopeful um, that it's going to yield um, some great finding, well, maybe sobering findings, but mm -hmm. important to enact into law. And so I, I look forward to that. Another piece of legislation very quickly was the economic development bill. And the economic development bill contained millions of dollars of bond authorization for money for Arlington and for across the Commonwealth, which doesn't become real until the governor funds it. So I won't put too much attention onto that, but also money for small businesses during COVID, other folks to help kind of lift the Commonwealth up. So it was really important bill. A part of that bill also was what we call the student bill of rights, borrower bill of rights for students who are taking out loans to afford to pay for college. And this is important to make sure that there's no predatory mm -hmm. um, type of actions on the loan agencies against students and their families. So to me, that was a really, really important bill. And I was very happy that it was part of um, the economic development bill. There was also another important provision known as housing choice, which was gov the governor's zoning reform bill um, that had a lot of debate here in Arlington, but it would allow simple changes to municipality zoning laws around um, you know, everything from accessory dwellings to um, if you were going to change your zoning bylaws in municipalities like Arlington before you needed a two thirds majority to pass something. Now you need under this law, uh, a simple majority. Um, so we had those debates and it was within the economic development bill. And so I was happy that um, both of those pieces of legislation passed. There was also a very important bill that the House and the Senate passed early on, which was known as the Roadmap Bill to have Massachusetts achieve net zero by 2050, which of course is the equilibrium between um, the gases emitted from us and then the amount of the pollutants we take out of the atmosphere. And the bill had a lot of other good things too, including one of my provisions, um, which increases the renewable portfolio standard even more aggressively so we can achieve 40% um, renewable energy um, by a certain date. So, you know, I think it's 2030, but to try to get us onto the road to 100% renewable energy by 2050, we know there's tons of steps uh, in between that. But for whatever reason, that was surprising to me, the governor decided to veto the whole legislation. And I was very disappointed by it because this legislation had hearings. Um, it had uh, six months of deliberation by the conference committee. This was not something that we just passed in, at, the, at midnight, right? right? This was something that we were deliberating on. The Senate did a debate in their version early in May. We did ours over the summer. I think, think the Senate did theirs in January and we did ours over the summer. So, and then we had the conference committee for six months. Well, we did other things, but they tried to get a bill that on balance was, was right course of action, but really dealt with climate change as the emergency that we both know that it is. And another portion of that uh, bill that did, um, that bill um, was around uh, dealing with um, environmental justice communities. So we know that when someone comes to town to put something that may emit many pollutants and greenhouse uh, dangerous gases, they're probably not going to do it in Arlington. They're probably not going to do it in Lexington. They're probably not going to do it in Newton because those residents, uh, company included, <laughs> are active, right? They know, you know what's happening in our town and you're not going to, if you see something like a, like a compressor station try to get jammed into Arlington, um, you're going to speak out. And a lot of people in Arlington would speak out as, as well as myself. But there are many communities uh, where that's not the case. Uh, many of those communities are gateway communities, uh, many cities, kind of like, I don't want to name you know, right. random cities, but you know, Revere uh, and Winthrop are considered gateway cities. 
Um, and it seems a lot of those uh, compressors and other type of environmental pollutants get put in those communities. So environmental justice mandates that those individuals will have a stake at the table. They'll be part of the process. Something just won't be jammed through. They're gonna actually be part. And so uh, to me, all these things are really important. The governor decided to veto it. Um, yeah, so I, let, let, let me ask you about that for a second. Um, sure. You know, you, you were saying that you were surprised by that. And um, I can hear from what you described that certainly part of it, part of your surprise might derive from the fact that the governor could see this coming for a long time down the pike. And obviously, as you said, there were months of deliberations and certainly he and his office would have been aware of what the contents of that was. Um, I'm wondering if that's what's surprising to you, um, that he would have known and why didn't he, you know, register, like try and weigh in before, or is it that it, it is at odds with other messages that he's been giving uh, around climate change, because this has been, you know, frankly, for a Republican governor, one of the ones who seems more out front in terms of acknowledging uh, climate change and its deleterious effects and signing on to at least agreements to do things about it. Right. Um, so, James, to answer your question, I would say all of the above. Okay. Um, so this was not a surprise. We've been working on this for a while. Um, in the last state of the state address a year ago, the governor proposed this, a roadmap to net, you know, net emissions by 2050. Um, he proposed it. So I was shocked that he decided to veto it. Um, I think he said it, it went too far. I think some of the corporate interests in Massachusetts did not like this bill, very particularly because it takes money out of their pocket in some, in some cases, or it forces them to um, make standards. And believe me, I, I support 100% renewable energy. I don't believe this bill even reached what I believe is necessary to address climate change. And right, so it didn't go far enough interest. in some ways as far as you're concerned. Right. So correct. So Gov but Governor Baker felt it went too far. Um, and even, you know, the other night at his state of the state, he addressed the bill, but he didn't say he vetoed it. So it was kind of, um, you know, it was not particularly transparent. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Speaker Mariano and uh, Senate President Spilka um, filed the bill immediately along with the chairs of the environment of the telecommunications committee, Mike Barrett from Lexington and Tom Golden from Lowell. They filed it immediately. Uh, we had a temporary rules and uh, the bill got passed uh, with um, veto proof veto majorities majority. in the House and the Senate. And so if the governor decides to veto the bill again, I think we'll quickly override uh, the veto because it was the intent of the legislature. So that's good news and that's work this session, but it really derived from work right. last session. So those are just some of the examples, um, James. We also passed a, that did not go over the hump, but we did, the House passed a really important foster care legislation around foster care parents bill of rights. And it was around giving rights to foster care parents um, who uh, really deserve to be treated better mm -hmm. um, by the Commonwealth. And um, so we couldn't get that bill um, through conference committee or over the hill, if you will. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be one of the bills, many bills that we address this session. Yeah. So let's talk about this session. And first of all, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of what you mentioned just now reflect uh, conversations that you and I have had over the years and your priorities that come through in those conversations, which is, you know, advocating for and working on behalf of, of vulnerable populations, whether it's mental health, whether it is housing, whether it is poverty or food insecurity. It's something that you've been, you know, I've noticed you have walked that walk as well as talking the talk before these years now. So um, I, I know that there's legislation you did not get to mention. I'm sure that it fits into, uh, in a lot of ways, those categories as well. And there's probably stuff that you will talk about in terms of what's coming up. But an acknowledgement that, yeah, you're you're still at it um, with the things I that are important that. to you, obviously. Um, so tell us, yeah, what, what um, you know, in addition to what you just mentioned, um, what, what else do you hope, you know, in terms of the foster care, what else do you hope 
uh, to, or do you, do you see coming down the pike here in the next month, two months, and then on from there? Well, my hope is that this will be a very ambitious session to produce really great progressive pieces of legislation that improve the quality of life for people in Massachusetts. Now, the devil's in the details of what it would look like. Um, we have till February 15th to file uh, members of the House, members of the Senate have till Friday, I believe it's a Friday, February 15th, to file legislation that will be considered by committees and the membership over the next two year period. So after we file, then we have about a week to co-sponsor pieces of legislation. You know, some of them will be new files and some of them will be refiles, things that we have filed in the past that we just couldn't get it over the goal line. Um, I think the legislative process is designed to be cumbersome in many ways to try to make sure there's not unintended consequences, but a bill needs to be passed by the House and the Senate or the Senate and the House and then to the governor. And it's a it's not an easy process, but it's an important process. Um, so I am in the middle of putting together my agenda for the coming term, James. I can now I'll mention kind of, you know, I'll file close to if not more, 60 pieces of legislation. Certainly not every piece of legislation is a chief priority of mine, mm -hmm. but I can just kind of run through some of the yeah, bills. Give us, give us the greatest hits, because obviously we can't, we can't hear about the 60 and we're not gonna ask you to name the 60. Right. Yes. Um, I, but you know, yeah, we want, I'm sure the audience would be interested to know what are the, what are the big ones um, as far so, as you know, Absolutely. So we're still involved in the coronavirus pandemic um, with really no end in sight. You know, we see the vaccines being distributed very slowly, um, but we still believe we'll be in this situation for the next several months. And with different variants coming from England and Brazil and L.A. or California, you know, it's a it's a dangerous time and it, it's a time for people to remember to continue to follow the regulations of the CDC from wearing masks, even double masking to washing your hands, getting hand sanitizer, socially distant. But we know that people continue to live with this pandemic. And we know that the state government has to support them. Mm -hmm. So I am filing a bill uh, establishing at least 14 days of emergency paid sick time for workers of the Commonwealth because no worker should have to choose between their job and taking care of them and their kids and family members who suffer with COVID. We also don't want people to go into work if they have COVID. You know, it's, it's just not good public policy. So it's important to establish, you know, we do have paid sick days in Massachusetts, but this is pandemic related um, that we're hoping to get past. And, you know, I think uh, we filed it first last session. We had over 90 co-sponsors. So to me, this is really important. And to me, it continues the work of dealing with the coronavirus. And as we come, hopefully, to the end of that virus, we have to remain vigilant. But government, especially state government and the federal government, but particularly in this case, state government has to step up and take care of um, the residents of Massachusetts. And this is one way of doing it. Yeah, and you know, you're not, it's not just the residents of Massachusetts. Uh, it's particular residents uh, who, uh, as you and I have discussed before, over the years and also uh, within this pandemic time, how the, how COVID has exposed and exacerbated the existing inequities uh, in our society in so many ways. But including the in the pop within the populations you were just mentioning, those who simply don't have the choices that you have and I have, for instance, for how it is that we are going to be able to operate through this. And you know, I work from home. I know you do an awful lot of legislation, all of you, um, out of your homes these days. Um, and we're talking about people, as you have already. Uh, referenced who who don't have that choice who have to choose between you know having a job keeping a job etc and the health of their family all too often so yeah I, I I hope I sincerely hope that you have them top of mind I know you do I have confidence in 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 you and in our other 
rep, you know, our other legislators um, who represent Arlington for sure. I do hope the state house has its eye out for uh, uh, on these folks because it, it's just wrong <laughs> uh, to during to that you know during any time, but especially during a pandemic. Our role as government is to support the most vulnerable populations and. Uh, unfortunately, um, whether it be statewide or federally, uh, many of the safety net nets have been cut mm -hmm. and people aren't getting the support they need, whether it's small businesses. Now we are trying to do you know, more loans, but it's not enough. And so my bill focuses around the personal health and well-being of the individual across Massachusetts, but also their families. And so I'm, I'm hoping, I've heard great signs from the speaker, from the Senate president. So I'm really hoping we can take this bill up um, in the earlier part of the session, like we just uh, talked about with the energy bill. Mm -hmm. um, so in another piece of legislation, and I, I, I wasn't planning on really talking about this bill, but because it, it it's not COVID related, mm -hmm. but it is specific related to the populations you just mentioned, James. So we know about the inequities that are caused by race, by income level, by sex, um, you know, we know that these are that these are real, and part of government is to uh, step on the lever of justice and to give these individuals some dignity and equality, especially dignity with work. And uh, this session, uh, I have filed this in previous sessions, but I'm really hoping now that we've increased the minimum wage, the, one of the highest in the country, we've um, one of the best um, paid family medical leave programs, earn sick time. Um, but that doesn't always, those can help and those are important, but they don't always help the situation of all workers. Mm -hmm. And so I have filed legislation to specifically deal with workers who are working two or three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. So these are the individuals who work in motel, hotel chains. These are the individuals that work at big box stores like Walmart, okay? And these are the individuals that work at McDonald's or Wendy's or, you know, the big chains. Many times these individuals are balancing childcare, just like all of us, and trying to get uh, an increased degree. So they're working hard to, to finish their bachelor's or their associates or, you know, going to a community college or a state university or UMass. They're trying to balance all this and still trying to afford childcare, trying to afford rent and you know, trying to lift themselves up, which is hard during any time of the year, especially during a pandemic. But many times these workers you know, that are scheduling two or three part-time jobs and all the things I mentioned, James, go to their schedule to work, they go into work and then they're told, oh, I don't need you, um, you can go home. Well, they don't get paid for that. And it's incredibly unfair. So we're trying to put some policies in place, 10 days, where a worker has to be told when they're scheduled. And if they're not, if the employee or employer does not need them, that's fine, but they still should get paid mm -hmm. for that work. Now we carve out things like uh, snow days and things that are what we would call active um, weather beyond the control of anybody else. So we understand that. But this is trying to put dignity in the work and trying to help these individuals through no fault of their own who are trying to work hard, um, trying to make ends meet. So I believe it's a fair bill. And so I think that's kind of further the work that we mentioned during the emergency. Okay, so just, just to just make sure that I'm clear on the provisions that you were just uh, outlining. Are you saying that it would be up to 10 days of a situation in which a worker was assuming that he or she would be working that day and arrives and then there's not work? Um, and so then they go home up to 10 of those kinds of instances where they would be paid for that day's work? Right. So the, the employer has to provide the schedule. 10 days before that employee. Okay, that's what I was wondering. So you're, the 10 days you were referring to is really has to do with the notice that the employee has um, of what his or her schedule is going to be. And then in addition to that, there is the implicit promise that if for whatever reason they don't work on one of the days that that schedule says, 
they're still going to get paid for it. That's the goal. And the goal here is to have some predictive scheduling, mm -hmm. not chaotic scheduling. Um, well, like I said, there's a lot of carve outs that things that, um, you know, the employer um, can't help with like snow or, or emergencies or things yeah, like that. You were referring before acts of God kind of thing. Sure. Ab yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And um, but this only involves employees. It doesn't involve employees who work at a small business. This is tackling employees who work for motel hotel chains, large big box stores and fast food companies. So we're trying to really target the employee and we're trying to target uh, where we've seen a lot of problems in the practice of scheduling. Mm -hmm. It also tries to address the issue of clopening. So these are when employees are forced to work the closing of a shift and the opening. So they're, they're not given enough time to uh, sleep, to recover, um, right. recover. Now it doesn't ban the practice of clopening because some people like to do it, but nobody should be forced to do it. So this is just another piece of legislation. Um, we, we've talked we have, I just want to warn you, we have about three to five minutes left. Oh, so. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, quick is never easy for me. As you yeah, know. no, I, I, and I should have given you earlier warning. No, no, no anyway, I appreciate I'll... the opportunity. So I will be refiling my 100% renewable energy bill, which is really, really important. We've talked about that in the past. And then the two other pieces of legislation uh, that are really important to me that I will be filing, one, as you know, I care very much about public higher education, 29 campuses across Massachusetts, which really is the incubator for innovation and the launching pad for successful futures. You know, we have 85% of the people who leave UMass or a state university or community college stay in Massachusetts. They invest. Kind of like K through 12, we have underfunded public higher ed drastically. And when times get tough, we cut, cut, cut. So I am working with the MTA and many stakeholders, and I'll be filing what's known as the Cherish Act. And it's about investing $500 million, similar to what the Promise Act did for K through 12, but into public higher education and to freeze tuition and fees for a, for a period of time to try to help, um, try to help the um, appropriation level that we give um, Massachusetts public universities and colleges. And the last bill I'll talk about, just because I think it's really, really important is, and I talk about it all the time, and that is what's called the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Bill. And this would allow students with autism and Down syndrome to go to college, to go to one of the 29 public higher education institutions. And the reason this is important, if you look at every metric for an individual with autism or Down syndrome who's had the opportunity to take college courses and you measure them amongst their peers when it comes to employment, when it comes to independence, um, the individuals who are allowed to take courses do far better and are far more successful than their peers who aren't allowed. And so to me, this is inclusion at its very best. And Massachusetts has had led the way, has led the way for K through 12 inclusion. Um, <clears throat> to me, this is a really critical civil rights piece to allow these individuals, who are honestly no different than you or I, to be able to go to college. And we've had hearings on this before, where we've had students come and be able to articulate to us that they see their peers after high school go to college and they're not allowed to. And so what my bill would say is that the MCAS would not be a barrier to these students, that their teams in high school would decide if they can go, but the barrier would not be there and they would be allowed to go and to experience the same thing that we're able to when we go to college, so. Well, let me just say on that, that I think one of the great benefits for myself um, in terms of being able to talk to you over a period of years with these regular conversations and updates, and for anybody who has been tuning in over that time, I think one of the great benefits is that we, I have heard you speak about this with the same kind of uh, passion and devotion for some time. 
And what that illustrates to me is what you said earlier, legislation takes a long time. It's a, it is a cumbersome process as you described, but I think it's great for me and hopefully for our audience to hear that you, have, you, you, there are things that you are just going to stick with, you know, and, and that you are going to eventually see those over the finish line, one, one assumes. But it has been going on for a while. You've been trying and it hasn't gotten there yet. Um, but this is, a, this is the latest reminder that these things are not just stuff that because it's hard, you're going to let go. And I think that that's good for us to know. It's, 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 um, it's kind of the painful reality of legislation. So there have been many times where I got a bill um, passed by the House and not by the Senate. And one, another session passed by the Senate and not by the House. And so you need to get a bill engrossed in the House, engrossed in the Senate, enacted in the House, enacted in the Senate, and laid before the governor's desk. And there are times where, you know, I'll give you a for instance. So I got a bill passed in the House this year that would allow for adoptees to get their original birth certificates. To me, that's very important. It's about their identity as individuals. The House did it. And we couldn't get it passed in the Senate. But that's, that's what happens. And so that's why we need to continue to file bills to try to get them passed in both branches of the legislature and then signed by His Excellency the Governor. So it's not an easy process. But if you're passionate, um, you'll stick with it. And if you're not, you know, that's why we have elections and that's why new people get elected, right? Because you want a legislature that's representative of the people and that will work as hard as they can and not kind of just do the job to get a paycheck. And that's why elections are so important. So, yeah. It, you know, and you just, again, it's, it, you just got to be able to deal with the setbacks uh, that you've just yeah. described with this particular legislation. And it, it, you know, that is, that is just the nature of the beast there with, with the work that you guys do. So good for you. Let me ask you, I'm going to go a couple minutes extra time here okay. because I just wanted to ask you for your thoughts, uh, stepping back and looking wider. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about, you know, the happenings of January 2021? Uh, what's going on, you know, the, the first weeks of the Biden administration? Uh, how hopeful or not are you for what's to come? Uh, what are your concerns, et cetera? If you can, you know, compress all that to a couple of minutes, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Well, I'll talk about one important issue that's on the minds of everybody who's watching and even everyone who's not, and that's the vaccine rollout. Um, we can't move on until people get vaccinated. We need to get um, the vaccines into people's arms. That's the most important thing. And Massachusetts has been very slow. And it's one of the more unsuccessful stories in the whole nation. And there'll be a lot of, uh, there's a lot of finger pointing, there's a lot of blaming. Um, but right now, my focus is around setting up these sites like in Gillette and Fenway Park that allow people to get vaccinated. And most importantly, um, you know, we have been filing legislation and the governor announced being pressured by the legislature um, that he is setting up a, a phone call hotline that will be staffed appropriately to set vaccination appointments up. And that's really, really important. I, James, I can tell you, I have many, many calls and emails from individuals that live in Arlington that are over the age of 75, that they couldn't make an appointment, they couldn't get through, they couldn't wake up at 5 a.m. to be, you know, it's like people were buying tickets to, you know, Bruce Springsteen or, or right. you know, Billy Joel, or maybe I can pick a more modern artist. But that's not the way it should have been when it comes to people's health. And so I think the phone line will setting up will help with you know getting people vaccinated. But it was a really slow process and it was not done well. And I am furious that you know we were told, oh, you know, go online and you can set up, you know, register online. And you had a 75-year-old in Arlington who went online and couldn't do it because it was so saturated or all the appointments were booked. And, you know, that's not fair when um, people are living with the fear of COVID 
already. We have to be honest. We have to level with the people and say, hey, you know what? It may take a few days to get registered, but to say, oh, you can do it all online this day, it was unfair and it, and it didn't happen. So I, I'm encouraged by the, by the hotline. And you know, my main goal is making sure people get vaccinated, but there's a lot of scared people out there um, you know, people who call me saying, you know, is it, is it time? You know, the, the administration worked really hard um, to set up a st tiered structure of when you would get the vaccine. And they were trying to focus on the most vulnerable populations, mostly those who live in congregate care settings. And that was well done. Um, but I think what happened was it was so specific that a lot of people were con confused you know, you know, they may have two comor two or more comorbidities. Mm -hmm. um, they feel like they fall under the the most vulnerable category. Um, but because it was so specific, there were so many questions that had to be answered, and the rollout of communication was not good. Just like the rollout of the recent vaccine uh, distribution, you know, centers online was not good. So we need to be, do better with communication. We need to do better. And my hope is with the hotline set up, if it's adequately staffed, we will start seeing more people being able to get vaccinated. You know, I, I have a mother who, who's, you know, older than 70 and she's had two bouts with lung cancer. And these are the stories that we hear across the Commonwealth. And so we need to get vaccinated. We need to get people healthy. Yeah, so certainly. In, in that you echo uh, a kind of, uh, you know, almost a, a fury as you were saying uh, that I've noticed among our local officials, uh, which is unusual uh, mm -hmm. around the communication specifically from the governor's office. So hopefully right. a hotline is a, you know, excellent first, well, I don't know if it's a first step, but it will be an effective step hopefully to dealing with that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, Sean, if in the time that you and I have been talking, you've had another half dozen or 10 phone calls or emails on this matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, all right, Sean, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm sure that we have left a lot on the table to talk about, but we'll just have to pick that up with our, our next update in, uh, you know, in a couple of months. Um, we wish you very Best of luck in pushing forward the legislation that you've described and the other things you have uh, on the table. And Thank you. Uh, Thank you, James. We, we hope that you will stay safe and that we will all uh, you know, be seeing each other in person sometime in the near future. I look forward to it. Thank you and stay safe as well, James. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Um, I have been speaking with our state rep, Sean Garbley, uh, for this legislative update as part of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. Sean, we appreciate you joining us, and thank you out there for joining us as well. We'll see you thank next you, time. Thank you, James. Have a great one. You too.